finished my first book in uh, June on the Range, and it's a buddy read with my buddy, Faceless Book Reviews. I'll put his information in the comments. We haven't discussed the book with each other, um, and we're going to try, I believe at this point, we're still going to try and put ours, synchronize our releases, so you can look at his first, or if you're coming over from his, welcome. The book we read was uh, by Max Brand. We found it on Project Gutenberg. And it's called Gunman's Reckoning. Here's one cover. It's not the cover I had. Uh, interesting, this is the, this little green cover is the one I had, the Gutenberg generic cover. But since it's a public domain novel, plenty of people have um, done the done their own versions, their own cheap versions online to try and sell it. And I was just struck, first of all, here somebody did some like weird ass uh, supermodel thing. Um, you know, there's a few cool ones, you know, I, I much prefer the old paperback covers. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of the covers here, it looks like people were just doing like generic, just like grabbing any detail from a Frederick Remington uh, Old West painting, uh, you know, and just slapping slapping it on as a cover, you know, even when it makes zero sense for the story. Here's Gunman's Reckoning with all those cavalrymen riding in, and there's no cavalry in this book, that kind of thing. I thought that was funny. I'd never read Max Brand before. This book is from 1921. I've talked about him a few times on this channel because he was so extremely prolific. Here's a picture of him. This one did used his picture for it, which is probably a, a not that bad of an idea. There's another one that used his picture. I guess that's a famous picture of him. I like this cover the best, probably. Anyway, what did I think? I enjoyed it overall. I'm not going to tell the whole story, avoid the spoilers, but some setup is, is necessary. It's about a guy named Donegan. Apparently, um, according to some sources I read, uh, this, this book has sometimes been issued under the name Donegan, which makes sense. It makes, uh, it's a really good Western hero name. You know, makes it sound like more of a mid-century, like something John Wayne would be in or something. I don't think John Wayne would play this character, though. Starts out on a train. Quickly moves to a town, though. Donegan won't go into the details of his past and everything, but he's right, riding the rails, and, and he jumps off the, this train. Yeah, I'm trying to pull back. I don't want to give too many details, but... He gets involved with this this family called the Macons. There's Lou Macon, who's the daughter, and her father, the Colonel, who is villain number one of many villains that will be encountered in this story. Just the right bastard. Uh, very well drawn villain. I really liked the villains in this story. I, th I thought they were very effective. He wants, he hires Donegan, he takes a look at Donegan and sizes him up pretty quickly and accurately as a guy who will uh, commit violence or is capable of violence for money. Hires him to uh, either kill or persuade his rival to, the, the colonel wants the, this, his rival named um, Landis, villain number two, to sign over a deed from this, this crooked, they've been in business together ripping off miners and now he wants to rip off, the colonel wants to rip off his partner. Is it the colonel or the, yeah, Colonel Macon. Um, I can't read my handwriting here. It's been a couple of days since I read this, but so he wants Donegan to go into the town. The, the, uh, Donegan randomly comes across this, this house and this family seeking shelter uh, before going into the town, which is called The Corner, which I really liked. 
I thought that was a really good name for the town. And, and Max Brand sets, sets the scene very well, I think. It's maybe a bit slower than a Western, you know, uh, written a little later that has more like, has the tropes down uh, more and that so it starts out maybe a little slower than those, but I was struck about how modern it, it felt. It, it, like I said, it was written, I think, in 1921 or published in 21. I think it probably, if you'd have told me it was published in 1945 or, you know, really up to any time, for the most part, until maybe nine, like 65, I, would have, I wouldn't have been surprised. It reads, it reads very well, or, uh, reads very fast. Anyway, the other thing that happens to Donegan when he's in the Macon household is he meets Lou Macon. I get, I, I suppose that's short for Louise or something. Who's a young girl, daughter of young woman, daughter of the Colonel. Who's kind of really under his thumb, really like psychologically controlled by her father. Anyway, Donegan falls in love with her in that super innocent way that uh, characters of that time fell madly in love permanently and are irrevocably forever with each other you know it's just the, there's just a lot of that this is kind of a convention of all of old stories like this anyway so he falls in love with his daughter and he's going to go take care of this this Landis guy and a lot of the book a lot of the, the story involves a love triangle, which becomes a love quadrangle, and maybe even a, a love pentagram, pen, pentangle, <laughs> um, because uh, um, Donigan has a bit of a quandary because he finds out that Lou, the girl he loves, loves this guy Landis, who becomes his rival, and then Landis, who the colonel once killed. It gets very convoluted. It doesn't stop there. Then there's another woman who loves who loves Landis or who we think Landis might love. What's her name? I don't know if I wrote it down. Nellie. Nellie the Blind. She's like a bad girl. You know, lose the, the angelic uh, innocent girl and and Nellie is, is the bar girl. The, the, there's a bar called Milligan's in the corner. Anyway, so Donegan has these, these, you know, he has his own reasons that he, now he wants to get rid of Landis, you know, besides the money. And he goes to the corner, the town, starts messing with everybody. He very quickly, he loves... And this is as far as I'm going to go into the plot is the first big kind of twist is that he decides he cannot hurt Landis even though he hates him. He wants to kill him just because, because Lou's in love with him. He decides he cannot do anything to hurt Landis because he must sacrifice himself because his love for Lou is so great he can never cause her misery uh, in the way that that killing Landis or destroying Landis would. But he does spend a lot of time messing. He's at, later he tells another character, you know, I've, I've been playing games with people in this town. He's, it kind of reminded me a bit of uh, Yojimbo, um, more specifically, uh, A Fistful of Dollars, where uh, a stranger comes into town. It's a, definitely a stranger comes into town. Type, plight, type plot where we don't really understand all his motivations, but he is messing with both sides. So he's messing with everybody. And later in the book, it takes this wild turn. Like, it's like I think you got enough going on here, Mr. Brand. But there's this whole other, there's this whole other aspect of it, of Donigan's past and, and why he's in the town and and more stuff going on that, you know, at, at, a, at a certain point I was like, wow, this is really getting complicated, which is not bad. 
it's fun. It's a lot of fun. It's a really wild ride. Um, so I did enjoy it overall. It might, it's it's not all a love story the way I described it, but it, the love story is a, a big, big part of it and is kind of Donegan's motivation and there's back and forth between these different characters that I've mentioned in terms of love. And there's some, there's some things that weren't quite resolved in the end, some characters that are kind of dropped and there's a bit of a, well, there's a very uh, annoying, irritating racial uh, stereotype character uh, named um, George Washington, what was his last name? Anyway, he's just, he's just a, a very terrible uh, stereotype. Unfortunately, the character doesn't doesn't appear that much in the in the book. He's in a, a couple of sections, but it's it's unfortunate to have to read a character written that way, a, a black character written that way. You know, it's kind of jarring at, at this time. But you know, those are the kind of things you encounter in old novels, and apparently Max Brand's especially known for it. But uh, there's some action, uh, you know, it's a bit slower paced than, than novels would be, the similar category, quote unquote, classic westerns, classic in the sense of like there's gunfighters and there's saloons and saloon girls and all that kind of stuff, um, but I thought it read very smoothly and, and I enjoyed it a lot. Would I read more Max Brand? Uh, not right away. There might be some others if people would recommend one they really like. Well, you sort of picked this one at random because the title sounded good, Gunman's Reckoning. And um, I think I suggested it. And just because of the Max Brown Westerns on, on Gutenberg, there's like seven or eight, I think. This one had the most downloads. So I thought, well, maybe people like it the most. And it's not too long, about the length of a regular Western. It's, it's worth checking out if you're really into westerns and I think that's all I have to say about it I'm glad I read it I'm glad I can say I read Max Brand there's a kind of you know some some of these older genres used to be more of a thing when they talk about the big three like the big three in science fiction used to be Asimov, Heinlein and Clark big three in mysteries used to be called uh, Dassel Hammett Raymond Chandler and James Kane Although two of those are private eye writers, and James Kane wrote uh, standalone stories, I never really understood that link. But they're all great writers. Maybe that's the link. And, and for a while, it used to be at least growing up, like the for me, the time I grew up, the the big writers, the quote unquote Western writers, the big three would be Louis L'Amour, Zane Grey, and Max Brand. Uh, Louis L'Amour probably being the most popular and the best. Zane Grey being the most classic and Max Brand being part of that, that trio. Those are the ones you would always see that are still in print today, which says something. You know, this is the same era that, uh, that Edgar Rice Burroughs was, was, was producing his most famous work. You know, Edgar Rice Burroughs, Tarzan of the Apes was written in 1912, published in 1912, I think. Maltese Falcon would be published in 1929. This is right in the middle of that era where American popular fiction really came into a modern era, I think. When you read something before, you know, from the 1800s, it, it feels like it's, I mean, from the, yeah, from the 1800s, it feels like it's written in the 1800s, something. But a lot of these popular writers from the early teens, and the same thing with Ag Agatha Christie and England, these people who started right now their, their books, the earliest books are in the public domain already. They really are doing something very similar to contemporary writers. It's a little bit slower. It's not like trying to read some, you know, Henry Fielding or anything like that. It's basically like reading contemporary fiction, except, you know, the attitudes are uh, a lot different. Uh, uh, you know, racial attitudes and things like that are different, less, less, um, kind, of, kind of jarring, you know, if you're not used to it. But I think people who 
watch these kind of channels and read old, old pulp books and stuff are, are aware of that and they can proceed accordingly. So that's it for this one. I'm glad I read the book. I am looking forward with everyone else to read Faceless Book Review's review of it and see where we agree or disagree or whatever. And it's on to more Westerns.